uh, to begin with, uh, my name is Patrick Walsh. I'm the superintendent at BBE. I'm also the high school principal. Um, uh, kind of in name only. I, I do some of the fun stuff and I don't do some of the things that I, I used to do. Um, I was a, I have been a high school principal for 23 years. Um, so I have a lot of experience of what doesn't work and what does work. Um, and it has taken a long time for me to uh, figure some things out. And uh, I think back to all the injustices that I did with uh, kids uh, and, and staff with uh, some of my scheduling concepts. And I realized, uh, like I said, quite some time down the road that some of the things that we were doing were actually counter, counterweights against any progress we were trying to make in the school. Um, so um, prior to being at BBE, I was at Hutchinson. So I got a, as a principal, so I got a taste of what it's like to be in a bigger school, big school and Quite honestly, when I came back to BBE, it was like I needed to uh, go experiment with some of the things that I hadn't figured out in a smaller school. So um, I think that was kind of my mission. And uh, coming back, uh, um, it's kind of just the tale of, of all of these things as we go through. Um, I'm going to share my screen right now, um, which is much better than watching me. So. Uh, where do we have that? I'm loading, get rid of this, present. Okay. Um, one of the first questions I have is, this is a little Bob Dylan quote, when you've got nothing, you've got nothing to lose. And sometimes with scheduling, that's kind of how it looks to me is that, you know, we don't have anything there that we really want to keep, but, uh, um, we are, we're fearful of the change. And my opinion sometimes is that sometimes if it's not, you know, broken, you need to break it. And I think scheduling is one of those things. Um, questions that you have, and I'm, I've got a, probably a wide group here. So I, what are some questions that you have going in that you want answered? And I'm just going to write these down as we go. So Dave, uh, Dave Ertle, uh, a lot of respect for you. What what would you want to get out of this whole thing? Well, and um, just in in your description, uh, uh, I'm always willing to uh, to review, to be open to master schedule changes, whether it's uh, uh, college into schools, houses, academies, what's out there, what's moving and shaking. Um, yeah, I'm trying to always uh, well try to stay, stay ahead of the curve. So. Sounds good. Anybody else? Dean Yoakum, Parker's Prairie. Mike Colness, East, East Grand. You know, I, uh, I'm not in the principal role anymore. Uh, did that for many, many years, but I did invite our high school principal, Brian Lord, to attend this today. Uh, first of all, to see your stellar performance, Pat. But also, uh, we are transitioning to a uh, you know, career academy model here at East Grand Forks, and uh, just want to uh, hear what you have to say today. Good okay. morning, baby. Okay. You can help kids that are struggling. Okay. Anybody else? Hearing that your child or your sibling. At the start, my name is We're a school about your size, so we yep. watch your video. Yep. Therapy. Our interest is, is can we make our schedule uh, similar to what you have is what we're we're looking for. Doctors, okay. researchers continue to search for the cause. Jim Men Bold, did you have similar? Yeah, I've actually before I even registered for this, I I my counselor's at your building right now today, uh, working oh. with your counselor just to find out a, a little more than this. But you know, how did I guess one of my big questions is how did you get your staff, your faculty on board with this. Every donation okay. helps to find a cure for these cancers. Please donate online or drop. Sorry about my message here. If I could shut that dang thing off, I certainly would. Okay. It's one of my pet peeves as an administrator. I hate those dang things. I hate them as a teacher and I hate them now. Okay. So I'm going to start off. Uh, when I first got to uh, BBE, I was reminded looking at that seven period schedule of how unrelenting and traditional it was. 
Um, when I talk to people about sharing, whether we go to an ITV meeting or any type of a meeting where we're looking to collaborate, uh, I had it at every school I've been to. And it's like, well, we have band fifth hour. And I'm going, how do you know that? Well, we just have it there every year. And then it's like, when do you have uh, the, you know, shop? Well, that's always first hour. And pretty soon, you know, you hear of all these, you know, um, basically sacred cows in the schedule and, and people can't change anything. So when I was at uh, Hutchinson the last, uh, you know, from 2011 to 2018, I started seeing a lot of the, even in a bigger school, we couldn't get anything done when it came to get, came to the electives. And I started thinking about what I thought was a perfect schedule for, for a principal and what teachers thought was a perfect schedule for them. As a principal, I wanted to have at least 20 kids in every classroom and no more than 30 in any classroom. As a teacher in Hutchinson, I, I come to find that their definition of success was when they had seven or eight or nine kids in an elective, they thought that was perfect schedule for them. But certainly when it came to the budget, that wasn't going to work. So it was like, some of these things started slapping me in the face, like, wow, you know, you've been doing this for a long time and surreptitiously you've been destroying innovation instead of uh, making it happen. So I used to, you know, as doing a master schedule, I still do this, is that you literally will have an idea at 1230 at night and you have to write it down or pull up your spreadsheet because you want to make sure you don't forget it. Um, so you get really immersed in that schedule as a high school principal. Uh, we always wanted kids to take electives. You know, the beginning of the pathways and academy journey for me started at Kenyon Wanamingo. Um, and we would have like these great classes like CAD and we'd start these things and nobody could get in them. And I was mad at the kids. It's like, why don't you take that? And they go, well, it's the same hour as pre-calc and or the same hour as band or the same hour as this. And it was like, there's so many singles in there that, that pretty much we could never get more than six or seven kids in there. And what I found is that half the kids that wanted a class didn't get it and half of the kids that were in a class didn't want it and basically they're saying well the lesser of two evils is me just to take this class the other thing is so we get to bbe and uh ironically the counselor here was one of my students at kenyon wanamingo she was student council president in fact and, you know, she certainly had some trepidation about some of these changes because they were taking a hit on the sacred cows that were in the school. And many of our upper class students, they didn't want things to change because they pretty much were in the junior senior slide of taking study halls, work experience, online college, high school, um, et cetera, of my first year here. So I didn't say much, but I'm just watching and I'm like, um, you know, some of these things are just basically not engaged in what we were doing. Um, then when we looked at our schedule and I talked to Christine and I said, well, you know, what happens when a kid comes in to um, take a class? She said it was a concession. It was an admission that we don't have any choices for them. It's so embarrassing sometimes that I don't have any anywhere good to put the kids into. We all know that students had little choice. And even when they did, there's only a small chance the class would appear in the right place. As we consciously built the next year's schedule the first time, so this is now I'm going into my second year, uh, we got to the end of this scheduling uh, session of four to five hours, and I am not kidding you, the schedule looked damn near exactly the same as, as the one that we always had. And Christina's response was, I know, here's what we have to work with. It always ends up in the same place. Um, high schools across America have a master schedule that's driven by all of these sacred cows, state requirements, local requirements, departmental needs, um, trying to keep people full time in the electives. So we set up these little scenarios to ensure that they have exactly a full time job and we don't really want to change the schedule at all because that can really tamper with that. In a small district, ultimately, you only get one or two chances over seven periods to find the right spot. And I'm just going to open up our schedule just for a second here. Um, and I've got every year mapped. So this is before I got here. And actually, I'm going to start with the high school requirements. So this is what we were looking at when I got here. We had a civics in the ninth grade. We had a fax IT or ag where they had to take two of the three. That was in the same hour. So by the way, when we have fax IT and ag that hour in, in ninth grade, 
you can't have any electives. Any of your kids are taking any of those electives. In a small school, we may only have three or four electives teachers. And so we lock them up there. We lock them up in seventh grade. We lock them up in eighth grade. And suddenly they're all locked up. We had a physical education requirement. We had a class for the business teacher called freshman seminar, which is similar to a careers or things like that. And then we had down here a study hall and or music for freshmen. Literally, our freshmen had one choice. Are you going to be in the music um, block or are you going to take study hall? And so, again, um, everybody knew where all the kids were. If I asked Christina uh, where the ninth graders were fourth hour, she knew it from repetition. That the ninth graders would be in physical science and English, for instance, that hour, because there's two choices in a two section school and you block that out. And eventually you don't have any electives for the ninth graders. Then you go to the sophomore year and you can see the same thing applies. Um, you know, um, you have, you work that through your four core. If they happen to take a foreign language at some point, if they happen to take music, um, they really only maybe have one choice. So the only electives op that are available to that kid are in that one single hour. And you might only have one or two things that even a sophomore could fit in. So they all basically get herded into, into different pens. Uh, then it opens up in the 11th grade, you can see that there's a little fewer requirements and the 12th grade, there's, there's even more openings. But by that time, our kids are taking college classes, they're doing work experience, they're disengaged with the entire process, they haven't gotten into the uh, elective continuums. So they don't really have anything rigorous to take and they're going, well, I was going to take welding, but uh, yeah, I'm already doing welding at my job, and I guess I don't need to take it anymore. Um, so we basically kill all of the all of the innovations that we ever try with curriculum because there's nobody left to take them. Um, and if they are, they're they're you know four or five. We had classes with two, three, four, seven, and this happened in Hutchinson too. My first two three years in Hutchinson, we had the same thing that that happened there. Um, wherever you'd put a class, they, I mean, we had a three by five schedule, which we will go through that today. We'll look at all those things. So all of these highlighted areas, these blue highlighted areas are areas that we ended up tampering with. So if you go to the 2016 schedule, again, I'm not going to, I'm not going to pan it too much because I've certainly, you know, did it many times. So if you just look at the ninth graders, so in ninth graders, you know, they had the science nine. Here. Mr. Walsh, I, I, I can't see the schedule. Is there anybody else? Uh, bring your shared window to the front. Okay, I'm going to stop share. Thank you. Okay, so you should see it now. I'm just going to depict that ninth grade. So you've got English one, uh, for ninth grade, they've got math nine, and they had science nine. No choice. Science nine and science nine. There was two science nines there. I'm not exactly, oh, that was a pair of where the pairs were, excuse me. Um, geometry, that's the other one. So they had science and math together. And then uh, ninth grade, what they have this hour? Um, maybe world history, English 10 with social studies. That makes sense. And then they've got the fax nine, IT nine, and ag nine. That's their that's their electives block. And then sixth hour is probably the music. Yep, senior high band and choir, music. And then they come back into English nine and the social nine um, there. And again, their schedule's all locked up. We go to 2017, 18, we'd see the same thing. 2018, we'd see this see the same thing. And it wasn't until 2019, 20, two years ago our first pandemic year, where we even actually got to try some of these things. So I'm going to go back. Can you see this now, Jim? Can you see the B yes. requirements? Yes. Okay. So in civics, we knew that we had to create options for the ninth graders. So we said, what are our sacred cows? So one, facts, IT, and ag. This idea, what you do in small schools to balance classes, is one of the central things that you, I would say you need to change in order to get kids to have choice, because this is not a choice. 
you're telling them, you're telling a, you know, a male in that you take tech and ag, and then you, you take a girl and it might be, you take facts and ag or something like that. And even then they're not even balanced because they had, they had to pick something, but there was, there was limited to a few choices. Um, taking that might be their only pathway into those areas and they may never take it again because it's, it's all, everybody, everybody comes in with a wide set of uh, expectations. So that a lot of times these end up being more classroom type of classes because the kids vary so much and they're not as much hands-on as you'd like. Physical education, having all your kids take physical education when they don't have many choices, that is one that can get in the way. Freshman seminar, careers, uh, 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 maybe a mandatory ninth grade class study skills. These things get in the way. Um, so one of our big objectives was to get rid of those things. And we had a Spanish teacher. She was one of the first folks that really uh, gave me light. And she said, you know, I could have Spanish one, two, and three in, in my room at the same time. And we would all just, we would have a Spanish immersion experience, but they don't have to be at the same place. And then the social studies people, we talked to them and said, is your curriculum linear? And they would say, not really. Um, do, do you really want civics at the ninth grade? No, a lot of times the kids aren't really engaged. It would be almost bit better if we had a senior government class. So we actually dropped the civics requirement in ninth grade and just said, you know what, We're, uh, we need to create some openings there. So that was a really big thing for us. And you'll see later on in the presentation, and this happens uh, anytime you do this, you'll see an explosion in these entry level courses like uh, welding one, woods one, foods one, uh, textiles one, um, anatomy, uh, forensics, first aid. I can just go up and down the line. Um, you'll see great enrollment early in their um, experience in high school. And I think this is one of the biggest things when it comes to academies for the schools that are looking at academies. Um, you want kids to get depth of understanding in a given area. Um, it has to start at the ninth grade level or you'll run out of time. So having an alternate year curriculum. So you see American history and world history. Uh, our teachers said that that was not sequential. You didn't have to have American before world. So all of our 10th and 11th graders are actually, instead of two choices that they have as a, as a 10th grader and two as an 11th, it's not a choice. We just put them in there. We now have four sections of American history one year, and then we have four sections of American history the next year, which gives kids four different opportunities in which they can, um, they can access the curriculum. And if they run into band or, or something else, um, they have multiple places where they can get it again. English, our English teachers did the same. So we did, I'll just use the literature one year based and composition. And this is shared between the ninth and 10th grade. So now they have four opportunities. We took the health, the health requirement that was locally required and by state you need to offer it. And instead of this class that every sophomore has to have since 1962, um, they no longer have to take health. That doesn't mean we don't offer health and that doesn't mean we don't want people to take health. We do, in fact, we also think that the kids that get the most out of it are the kids that are most interested in it and are maybe heading towards healthcare where we want to customize that course towards healthcare a little bit more than we would otherwise because one third of our new workforce is in healthcare and so it's very important to have those gateways into um, your uh, academies by having that intro class but it's not required for every person one of the lines that we started saying in hutchinson and we do continue to say it here is and i'll ask kids uh, when we have a registration meeting even next week what class, what classes are most important to our high school? And the answer to that is all of them. Um, welding has got great value, and it but it has differing values for each student. Um, so, you know, we have this, this feeling, I think, in schools where, well, it's a fluff class, or they're going to take a slough class, they're going to kill down and just take foods classes, whatever. Foods classes is enormously important, but it's not the same degree of importance for every person. So um, I think as you personalize your school, you have to value every course in the school and you have to make sure that everybody who wants it has access to it. And then you also have to have the ability to make choices. 
Um, I think one of the things that I encountered, and I haven't listed this in the, in the um, um, presentation at all, but in Hutchinson, one of the big things was through the IEPs, um, our IEP students weren't getting any opportunity to take electives because we were so fixed on math and reading and the kids who were worst at math and reading had more of it than anybody. They were having two and three periods in a, in a five block day, uh, probably three or four assigned to math and reading, uh, study skills that would have helped them in the math class and then an extra you know, special study hall that they might have to uh, get through the English. So they weren't even getting in there. So that was one of the places that we really use to start changing how we personalize school and IEP should be personalized. To the degree, I would say that your IEP is so good uh, for students that everybody should have one. And I, I truly believe that. And so you can see a lot of the changes here, foreign language I've highlighted in, in different areas. And then also um, having all of our students do the, the math, uh, we'll get into this later too. So um, basically that's, that's, like a, that's where we were. Um, what are some of the big changes that we would make? I got to go back to my share and I'm going to go back to this right now. Oh, where are you? Okay, I got to get out again and then I got to get in again. No, nope, sorry. I'm running into my uh, technical difficulties here. Okay, close preview. Okay, macro level changes. These are changes that are big and they also have budget implications. So I'm gonna take you on a little bit of a, a math journey here. I'm a former math teacher. So I, I do get very enamored with uh, numbers and uh, apologize for that, but I'm just gonna dig a little deeper here. What is the most efficient schedule financially? What is the best for students? Are these the same answer? And there are so many questions you have to contemplate ahead of time. Um, Again, this is not a, a list that uh, you probably are disfamiliar with, but what is the cost per period for a course? You know, for me, I've generally thought of a, a course that we teach is something like around $10,000 a year. So, you know, if we, if we had an average teacher cost of $60,000 and our teachers teach six periods, I look at that as a $10,000 cost per period. If I have two kids in that class, then I'm looking at, you know, over the course of a year, that's $5,000 per semester. It's now $2,500, you know, per semester per kid. There comes a point when you really can't afford to offer those and you have to look at other alternatives if you're gonna do it that way. Do you include supervisions for those that need them? Um, I ran into it here, I've run into it almost everywhere, is that we had to assign a supervision for teachers because that was in the master agreement. And even though we didn't need them, by the way, reducing the need for study halls reduces the need for, for supervisions, which means that then those people can help with things that you really do need. You know, uh, in Hutchinson, we had at my first year there, we had 500 people in lunch and we had two people, including me, to supervise them. And we wondered why we had issues with lunch. Well, it's awfully hard to supervise that many people. We do need some help with supervision. Uh, who is responsible for creating a master schedule? You know, I always had to do that. I, I really didn't even know how to do it when I started as a principal, but I, I remember the first uh, principal problem I ever had, and that was I had seven kids in one Spanish one section, or, or Spanish two, and I had 43 in the other. And I remember the, the superintendent putting that on my desk, and he said, you got to fix that. And I'm like, how do you do that? And it was just like digging in and eventually you learned a lot about scheduling over that week because you, you learned to balance the schedules and, and again, um, um, the beast was born. How many periods should you have? Um, you know, in Hutchinson, we were always talking about a three by five schedule. Is there some way better we could do that? Um, um, is that the perfect schedule? Is it two by six, two by seven, all of those? What are the lengths of the periods? How long should you have in passing time? When you would add advisories, 
uh, that gives you just another block of time that everybody's got to do something. Are there creative ways in which you can do advisories? How long should they be? You compose them nine through 12 by, by Academy, which we did in Hutchinson. Um, you know, um, how are you going to execute the advisories? Do you need to have them every day? What are advisors that make things easier to schedule? Uh, given I'm, I'm a math person, I found, you know, in a two section school, you know, to, to really start thinking about things, um, you know, two by four um, made a lot of sense. If we have a four section school and we've got 100 and 110 students, you know, then if I'm going to do things, I have to think in fours. Um, if I can think in fours twice, that leads me to eight. Uh, what are the courses we have to do at minimum? Are there any places that you can innovate and meet a state requirement at the same time? Um, one of the things we did in Hutch was that we really wanted to, we got a million point one point six from 3M, uh, not all from 3M, but also our uh, people in the community. And, you know, there again, we wanted kids to have an opportunity to have just a first class opportunity from the outset. And in engineering, um, we looked at all of our science classes. We were a three term science school, so three by five. Three of them were used up by math. Three of them were used up by sciences. Freshmen didn't have any um, place. So we gave them choice in their, in their freshman year. And we started an engineering um, uh, class that met physics and engineering. And my, my first year of doing that, we had 125 students. So not only were they getting into CTE, they were getting into robotics and, and engineering. Um, and they were also meeting a science credit at the same time. What happens when your schedule conflicts with rigor or higher need? Um, again, very typical. You have to take health, it's required. Health and FIAT is required for all sophomores. You can't get out of that class. But I wanna take, I wanna take pre-calc as a sophomore because I don't have room in my schedule. This happened all the time in Hutchinson as we got better, better on our academies is that there was conflicts even then, but we had to have a way out of those conflicts. Whenever you replaced it with rigor or higher need, um, we would uh, utilize the rigorous course waiver to accomplish that. And always, what is best for students? Do your choices harmonize with this thought? Sometimes welding is more important than social studies. Sometimes. Sometimes social studies, taking AP Psych, is more important than welding. It, you, you just have to customize that to each student. Again, a mathematics thing here, type of schedule. When you go two by six, you get a teaching efficiency. If you teach five out of six, you get a teaching efficiency of 0.83 because you probably don't have study halls or very limited study halls. If somebody has a study hall, they have to have a prep. So then your teaching efficiency is only 0.67. It's going to cost you a lot for staff when you have only four of those six periods are utilizing teachers. Um, when you go to a three by five, it's really good from the teaching side because your teachers are teaching 80% of the time. They have four preps. Uh, we had no overloads. Uh, basically in Hutchinson overloads, that would have meant they would have been teaching all periods. So we didn't even have a possibility of really going to an overload. Um, and so your supervising efficiency though is the lowest of all of them. So one of the big problems we had in Hutchinson is that we didn't have any supervisors for anything other than just teaching. In a two by seven, you get five out of seven typically is 0.71. Uh, you have a few schools like uh, Osakis is one of them where you know back 20 years ago, instead of a cut, the teachers agreed to do a sixth class, which uh, bumps their efficiency up to 0.85 from teaching. There again, when they're teaching six, they're not gonna be doing something all seven periods of the day. Uh, but your supervising efficiency is 0.85 otherwise. They, they're going to help with lunch or the, a study hall. In the two by eight, of course, you can have teachers teach six or seven. I know of schools that do seven out of eight. Um, teachers tend not to agree to that, but that's 0.875 in a teaching efficiency. But for sure, even if you have six, you have a potential to get up to 0.875 on that efficiency. Finally, the four by four, obviously, if you have three teaching periods, that's one of the fewest of each. And so schools, when they say they have to cut because the block schedule is too expensive, it's because they probably have three teaching 
and they, they have a partial supervision there. Um, but if they do have to, you know, if they have to do a split study all or something like that, um, you're going to get, you're going to get an opportunity to get up to 0.875 there. Anybody have any questions with, with the math there? Do you understand what I'm talking about? This teaching efficiency is a very big thing to consider. Um, because I think when we have teachers who are highly, highly qualified, and we need to get them in front of students as much as possible. I think that's one thing that's a real drawback of the seven period day. The seven period day has got the least efficiency when it comes to teaching. It almost requires study halls and those types of things to make it go. And in schools like this, they value their study halls because they can get kids in them. And if you got a place where you can harbor 40 kids, uh, then you go that, that per student efficiency, um, you're, paying, you're paying people to do study hall in that example. More math. For example, a two by six versus a two by seven. In a two by six, each semester will have six different classes or 12 choices total. So it's very efficient. And a lot of the bigger schools, when they had budget cuts, they get down to a six period day because it is, it is the ultimate inefficiency. You get one each of your core, you get a music period and a language period. So freshmen and sophomores, they're pretty locked up. I don't know where you're, the only people that are gonna get electives are people who don't take foreign language and who don't take music, one or the other and or, so they might get up to two possible electives. So no electives possible if you are the basic everyday American college prep student. And if I go to uh, the college prep factories, you know, the Wyzettas and the Minnetonkas and the Edinas, this is very common where their kids don't take any CTE classes. Consequently, they have very few CTE teachers. Um, it's pretty efficient. Teachers teach five uh, periods, no supervision, which is 0.83. Excuse me, I put a typo there. Um, then you go to the 2.2 by 7. You do get choices, but typically they fill them up with study hall. Every kid here basically had study hall when, when other than the music people that were in language, every kid had study hall. We had 200, 200 and some 225 kids that took study hall uh, in, uh, out of 300. Um, this seventh period available generally gets eaten up by a required RP or vocational elective. This works great for the scheduler and the staff. They know what they're gonna get. It doesn't take long to do the schedule, excuse me. And it, uh, it does eliminate the voice and choice for the student. So me coming from Hutchinson where we developed an academy on model pretty well, when I went out to the seniors who were sitting there taking online college high school and things like that, and we would have routinely, we might have 20 seniors sitting out in a place we call the cabs, um, the senior cab area, and they were taking online classes at any given hour. And, but I'd ask uh, somebody, I'd say, hey, what are you doing, uh, Allie? This is one uh, discussion I had. Allie, uh, what are you doing next year? Uh, I'm going into healthcare somewhere. I'm not really sure what. And I said, so what are you doing in terms of your classes to get you ready for healthcare? Oh, I don't have anything. I've got a study hall and I've got college classes. I don't really have any room for anything. So she is going to go to college and get into healthcare. And she's never had any elective. She's never had forensics. She didn't take advanced chem. She didn't take advanced bio. She didn't take anatomy. She didn't take anything that led her to help her with that transition from an academy down, and I found that everywhere. Um, same thing at Kenyon Wanamango, same thing at Hutch. Until we really looked at what we did and we got kids involved early, older kids were already burned out of our system and they were just trying to get out. All electives teachers look at classroom where half that didn't want it, want to get it and half that wanted it didn't get it either. However, I said that. Half that want it don't get it, half that get it don't want it. And your efficiency is very low. I'm gonna stop and go back now. Um, as I talk about those things, I just want from you, tell me anybody who sees something different than what I just showed. Or anybody that wants to say anything at this point. No go? Well, I'll, I'll say something. We, we're look, we have a seven period day right now in East Grand Forks. 
we're looking and we're trying to do that academy model that you're doing at Hatcher did in Hatcher whatever, but we're looking to try and do what you were talking about, adding another period, trying to add an eight period day, but then put also in a modified block. So like on a Wednesday, Thursday would be a four period block and a, and Thursday would be a four period block and seeing how, because what we're seeing is the fact that the, like you said, the electives are not being able to be um, taken because they're, they're tied into their five, cores that they have in ninth grade and then there's no room if they're a band choir slash foreign language person so that's what we're looking at trying to do we did that at kenyon wanamingo the modified block that was our answer to it is to get kids and, and it did definitely help and so i think that seven period day is a killer um i really do i mean it's it's so common and it's it's inculcated in in our system so big but it's it's really a killer for innovation anybody else Okay, I'll go back. I guess I have one question. How long did this take you to, like if we would start the process, we're, we're starting it right now. Is this like a year process, two year process? Uh, I know you gotta get the board to approve um, different changes. I think it, uh, it definitely is a two year, you have to get freshmen involved in this. Um, bring your shared window to the front. How do I do that? Are you guys seeing uh, how many teachers do I need at minimum? No, I'm gonna get back out. Seeing a blank screen. White screen now, okay. Um, how long does it take? You see the full screen now? All right. Yep. How long does it take? Um, I think uh, it's gonna, I think you can get it with your ninth graders. I think I would, I would really um, go back with my eighth grade registration. That's what we did in Hutchinson in uh, 2014, the uh, spring of 2014, we started, so it was my third year and my third go around with registration. It took us three years to really get all the infrastructure in place where we could roll this out with freshmen. Uh, Cause we didn't want to just talk about academies when we didn't really know what it was going to look like. So we started putting in places ahead of that but the the class of 2018 was the first one and we really did a robust job of of counseling our students in in eighth grade and so we brought them in and i will say that when those kids were seniors we still didn't quite have it because we weren't it took us a while even at with that group to really get that where staff understood what was happening but by the class of 19, so the second time around, they certainly knew what their tiger path was. And by the class of 2020, those kids knew it inside and out. When we had, uh, we finished a new high school in Hutchinson in 2018, uh, actually 2017, so the 17, 18 school year. Um, and we had many schools visiting us because 3M was touting us uh, nationwide. And so we had people from all over the country coming in and I simply would turn to a kid that was in 10th or 11th grade and I'd say, hey, tell me what Tiger Path means to you being in that academy. And they gave more eloquent answers than our staff probably could. They knew what they were doing. They'd been engaged from the beginning in ninth grade, every term, every trimester, they had something that was connected to their pathway. And by the time they were juniors and seniors, I remember, uh, a uh, Miller manufacturing guy came in for a tour and they're out of Glencoe. And we were looking at our CAD lab with 24 stations in it. And it was full, you know, it was 23 kids out of the 24 that were in there. And he goes, you have that many kids taking CAD? And I go, yeah, we have actually 115 kids in CAD, the CAD continuum one through four. And he said, you've got four levels of CAD. And I go, yes, sir, we do. And uh, he goes, I don't have anybody applying for jobs coming out of college that have that much CAD. And I said, we have six seniors who've completed all four levels of CAD. And by the way, these weren't the kids who weren't in band and choir and who weren't in foreign language. These are A students in a lot of cases who've had four levels of CAD because they started off, if you were an engineering pathway, you would be in CAD from your freshman level on. And these kids, you know, they knew, uh, they knew, uh, um, I'm Creo, SolidWorks, um, AutoCAD, 
and something else. I can't remember what the fourth language was. And maybe that was SolidWorks. But he said he doesn't have anybody applying for jobs. He goes, I would hire each of those people today. So I went to those seniors and I said, uh, Miller Manufacturing would give you a part-time job. Two of those kids went and worked for them because the other kids were still in activities and they couldn't do it. And then we had another kid who, um, it was uh, CNC out of uh, Dassel and he lived on the lake between Dassel and Hutch. He went over there and he was working the spring of his senior year, he was working four or five hours a day because he knew more than any of their programmers had coming in. So um, I think it takes probably two to three years to get it in, installed, but I would definitely focus on my eighth grade and ninth grade and let them just roll the way through. Um, here's another little excursion, uh, math excursion, but how many teachers do I need at minimum and at maximum? Um, so when you look at your number of students, you say 500, that's 125 in each grade. You could be sitting there looking at a four, four or five section school, you got a seven period day. Here's where the math comes into play. If at minimum you've got four sections, you can't have three, that'd be 42.3 in some of your classes, you wouldn't have enough teachers to, to handle them. And I'd say the maximum is probably at six. And you see that that group sucks up 28 sections a day up to 42 sections a day. If you multiply by the four grades at any time you need between 112 and 168 sections, because we're in a seven period day, having a study hall or a sixth class could bring me to six out of seven periods of supervision. But in the end, they would teachers would teach five or six. If we taught five, if we had five, we'd need at least 22.4 teachers. And if we went to six, we could get done with as little as 18.7. That would be like a school like Osakis. When they went to six out of seven teaching, they could employ less teachers, obviously, because uh, this should say teach six. So this is teach five and one supervision. This should say teach six and zero supervision. I got that backwards. Um, and then if they go to the higher end of this, um, you, you would need 33.6 to 28. So this is your range and you see you're ranging from 18 to 33 by the way that your contract sits. In that student teacher ratio, you go from anywhere between 22.3 out to 33.4. And some, of, some bigger schools are in that range where they have literally 35 kids in a sophomore health class. The requirements. What are the state and local requirements? And this is a really, I mean, this is where we started really making hay, I think, in Hutchinson is that we started really looking at these things literally. Students are required to complete two kinds of requirements. And this one, satisfactorily complete all state academic standards, which we were taking literally in Hutchinson. That's what caused our three-term science. That's what caused our three-term. So we were in a block schedule 70 minutes long and all freshmen had three different science. They had earth, earth uh, physics, and chemistry in ninth grade, and they had a three-term math. Whether they were in uh, algebra one or whether they were in geometry, it was three terms. Basically, they were also in three-term math um, their, their sophomore year. So again, no opportunities for electives unless they were disengaged. We took, we took our worst students and the people who were most disengaged, and then we tried to make the electives fly with them. And the second one, satisfactorily complete the state course credit requirements. But this, this is a conundrum, satisfactorily complete all state academic standards. How many kids don't meet our standards already? I mean, how many kids truly are proficient in biology when they exit sophomore biology? The answer to that is probably a majority of them. And it gets in the way if you read these things too literally. What are the minimum state requirements to graduate? And then I want, I put this thing in here because um, students need to complete the academic standards by taking a core course of study that equips them with the knowledge and skills they need for success. Highly skilled work and civic life. I think that's problem solving. Must include at least the minimum state course credit requirements. And a course credit is equivalent to a student successfully completing an academic year of study or mastering the subject matter as determined by the school district. We have a high school, high schools in which 
you know, I say this every year again with this, with the kids, we have a $10 diploma and we have a $10 million diploma. You determine its value. We have kids literally passing 28 credits or 56 credits. I don't care how you count them. They, they might get D minuses in all 28.0 credits. And that is a, a diploma. So if they just jump over the bar a little bit and they do that consecutively enough, then they graduate. And my argument would be, they didn't complete any of our academic standards. They just took a bunch of courses that got D minuses. When we start getting into engaging our students, I think we're speaking to a higher power. Four credits of English is, this is at the state level, Carnegie units, there's no distinction. It doesn't say you have to have this or that. You need four credits of English. More than likely, you need four credits that are taught by an English instructor in your school district. Three credits of math, including one that says Algebra 2. Well, what about Algebra 1? Some schools, uh, being the math teacher I am, I did plenty of surveys about Algebra 1. A lot of schools do Algebra 1 in ninth grade, even though it talks about they have to have an Algebra 1 credit in eighth grade. Although they need an Algebra 1 credit in eighth grade, that does not mean they can't have Algebra 1 in ninth grade too. And then you must have something that says Algebra 2 on it. Well, certainly any math teacher could tell you that there is no way that all of my kids are going to be proficient in Algebra 2. So we game it and we put something out there that says Algebra 2, Basic Algebra 2, um, Foundations of Algebra 2, uh, or something else. But they're certainly not proficient in all the Algebra 2 standards. Three credits of science, including one biology and one physics and chemistry, or the CTE but it must meet the standards underlying physics and chem. Here's an example of where I think it's how you read it. You must meet the standards underlying physics and chem. Taken quite literally, you would say they have to do physics and chem in addition to doing CTE, impossible. But I think those kids can be a lot more engaged and they're gonna get a lot more out of it than they can by taking a, a, a foundations and a theory of physics or your, your chemistry level class that you need for college. There's a little play and you have to use that CT one because whether it's in math, social, um, English communication or whatever, this is a big opportunity for you. 3.5 credits of social studies, including US World Econ Gov and Geography. Do any of these have to be a full year? Doesn't really state except for it says, up here, a course credit is equivalent to a student successfully completing an academic year of study. How would you possibly do five? You could take that literally and say you need 5.0 units of social studies because it doesn't say a half credit of this and one credit of this. At one time it did, it does not right now. It says 3.5, including these contents. How do you do that? One credit of fine arts, what counts as art? There's actually CTE is something that can count as art. It's controversial as heck in your school, but having multiple pathways into that art credit is another way to get kids into uh, more flexible foundations. So essentially you gotta have 14.5 required, 7.0 minimum credits, 21.5 minimum. What if you are a five period day, a six period day, a seven period day, or an eight period day? Is that fair? If you have eight periods a day and you start as a, is a um, freshman, you have opportunities to take 32 classes. So 21.5 is a bare minimum. If you require 24, uh, there's a lot of room for error. In, in fact, your $10 diploma more than likely is gonna be that. Um, when I was at Kenyon Wanamingo, we were surrounded by two by six schools. So because we had an eight period day and we had 32 credits, you needed 30 to graduate, we would have kids they can't make it there because let's say they're going into their senior year with 20 credits and one of our neighboring two by six schools of bigger of larger size they would go over there and they'd say well i can graduate at northfield um i, ca I can't graduate at kenya wanamingo but i can go over to northfield because northfield was a 24 credit graduation and they would just say well they had these units over there so um again that 21.5 um, can be very misleading. And it, and it could be a drawback about why your kids are transferring out. When I got to Hutchinson, uh, that was also a factor for us. We were losing about 20% of our students that weren't graduating with us. 
and they were migrating to the charter school or some somewhere else to another district because they couldn't graduate at Hutchinson with our credit requirements. So this is also an important thing to look at. The less there is to justify a traditional custom, the harder it is to get rid of it. Most of us look at these schedules and we see the dilemma that we have, but we can't get rid of it. So then you get into some of the smaller changes, fine tuning. So impact enrollment, where has this journey taken us? And again, in the, we've amassed 400 more enrollments per year. So we have 400 more students who are enrolled in classes in that semester. When you consider that each student can only take 14 classes per year, this is 30 full-time students we have reclaimed by the way that we are doing our schedule. We've actually reduced the number of full-time equivalent from that time. And where did these students come from? Study hall, work experience, and online college high schools. I'm gonna click on this button. Hopefully you can see this. But we track this, and this is something I did in Hutchinson too. Um, we had all of our gateway classes and how many kids are taking them. Um, even though we've changed some of those sacred cows, it really hasn't resulted in less enrollment for anybody and some substantially increased enrollment for others. Agriculture, and I, that's one where they were intact, I would say. Uh, has not hurt their numbers, they've, they've grown a little bit. Fine arts, not hurt their numbers, 40% increase in the number of people in, in those fine arts classes, um, in art specifically. Um, business, 380% increase, 17, 33, 49. Out this year, 145 business enrollments. I was keeping a full-time business teacher over here, and I have a full-time business teacher over here. To be fair, to be fair, we're doing less in the middle school and we're doing more in the high school because we've created room with, with our scheduling. English has not hurt them, 24%. Facts has not hurt them. Great teacher, she obviously, because she was a great teacher, she was uh, somebody that everybody accessed and the juniors and seniors, they, would may, they might take the facts because we had a great teacher. Industrial tech. 352% increase. Uh, this is true in Hutchinson is, is here. You notice here we have 10 students that took welding and woods together in combined in 1617, six students combined. We basically, these were dead. These were dead electives. And now you see the numbers that we have in them and CAD engineering, we've added CAD engineering and we've got a 352% increase in industrial tech. Math. Um, advanced math, um, again, because kids are identifying earlier, they were assigned to an academy, they understand that if you wanna be an engineering uh, major in college, you're gonna have to take pre-calc and those things. Um, none of our kids took those um, before. They were just taking college algebra and getting their college credit and being done. Um, they're also probably not getting engineering degrees when they get out because they have to make up the uh, math classes to get there. Physical education, 131% um, increase. Uh, with a lot more in the weight training, flexible, where you can have weight training one, two, and three, anybody in that room, personal, personal fitness. We can have anybody in the weight room at the same time. They're just in different curricula. Science and healthcare, 232% increase. Social studies down a little bit. Um, world languages up a little bit. And where did it come from? We went from 400 enrollments per semester in study hall support and ag co-ops um, down to about 35, 40. So we cut study halls from 225 um, study halls per, um, per term. So that's like 400 and some, um, excuse me, per, per year. We're about eh, study hall 76 out of 278, four times fewer people in study hall. That is big, but you have to have something for them to go to. Okay. Um, here's what we did. Major, give your freshmen and sophomores room to get into electives or they may never get them. They'll never want them. Kids that go to college, they'll get through their freshman and sophomore year in college. They still haven't had an engineer, engineering class 
and they might be just, you know, in school to be an engineer. They don't know why they want to do it. Um, they get assigned to be an engineer because they're good in math. Getting rid of required electives like art and PE, nine, I would get rid of all those. I would still keep them open and for the kids that want them and want to take them. Creating sequences for electives, welding one, two, and three. Having names like welding in society, uh, welding for the future, advanced welding, and something else is really, it, it does disservice to your kids because by the time you get out to be a, um, oh my gosh. Excuse me. So one of the things that I think is a killer is when you have names that don't connect in the sequence. Um, typically in, a, in high schools, you're going to see every class in the CTE area end up being a 9 through 12 elective because that's the only way they get the kids in the class. Um, they get four ninth graders, four 10th graders, four 11th graders, and four 12th graders. It's everything is an intro and nothing develops any deep skills that you need in an academy. Reducing, eliminating non-essential requirements as I talked about before. Using the rigorous course waiver, which I linked here. Um, I definitely think you have to add that to your graduation requirements. Um, this is a huge thing and I'm gonna click on that one. I wanna show you, this is Minneapolis Public Schools. We have it in our, I just wanted to, you to see that it's in a number of different places, but this is laid out um, by um, Minneapolis Public. The other aspect of this though, is the CTE. And I wanted to show you this. Right down here. Where are you, CTE? Right here. For example, particular courses and learning opportunities associated with career and tech may meet the requirements of the rigorous course waiver. So one of the things that we did is we really used that CTE exception to get kids in to CTs. So for them to skip um, maybe that algebra two requirement or the third level of math, CTE was something that we used. Um, when it says that they have to have things that are underlying those standards, they underlie. They're, they're not meeting the standards in an algebra two. They're also not, they're not meeting the algebra two standards in that ag class either. But the welding or uh, engineering, robotics, um, the, the math that they're learning in there and the type of work that they do with CNC mills and things like that is a critical aspect for you to change um, where your kids are moving to and making sure that you're supporting uh, CTE. I'm gonna stop right there again. Um, any, any questions with that? Value statements, don't like it, like it, never thought of it. Wait time here. I just have a question. So I'm a director of special services. And um, so thank you for presenting on this. It's eye opening. Um, how does it work with your special ed small group types of classes and when you're forming these master schedules? Um, well, because we have uh, multiple ways to get into a class, I mean, welding, you know, even in Hutchinson, if we could have welding one and two together, that was enormous because we had more places that you could access that. Um, when I first uh, started our academy program in Hutchinson, we probably only offer welding in two different locations out of the 15. And if then, if that was a welding one and a welding two, there's no access. You're never gonna have people get to welding three and welding four because it'll never fit their schedule. And special ed is critical because you can design um, a, a, a schedule for a special ed kid. But to me, we would start with welding, engineering, um, automotive, um, woods, that is the most important class in that special ed kids IEP. Not English, not, and if we had a, if, if the schedule was going to get in the way of them taking welding, 
that we were going to modify their IEP to eliminate the requirement because we can. And if I, if I would be able to do that for any kid, for any reason, I would say that that is a more rigorous alternative for them to go to a, a place that they're not going to be successful. They're running in a race that they're always going to lose. And for some of our kids who are DCD and, and whatnot, the very first couple things on their schedule is going to be hands-on things. They will not leave my high school without having a lot of hands-on opportunities. They will not exit our high school because they're falling behind with the credit requirements. They, I mean, that's the other thing, you know, going back to Hutch, I said, we lost 20% of our kids. So we'd start with 240. We would lose, we'd graduate 208. They weren't graduating because we were forcing our special ed kids to take more core than anybody. And I even had arguments with special ed teachers. I mean, professional, these are great people, by the way, they, they care. And they said, well, I really think reading is important. Well, I'm going to agree with you. Reading is central to everything. But how long are we going to continue to provide additional remediation for kids who are really struggling with that? Don't we at some point have to look at their vocational aptitudes and their ability to problem solve and their busy, ability to communicate, um, to get in settings where they can make money and they can make a lot of money, by the way. Uh, a lot of our kids that are coming out of uh, these vocational programs are starting at pretty much where a 15 year teacher might be. Um, so at some point we have to look at other alternatives. I would say in the high school is that time you have an IEP, a transition plan from age 14 to 18 that should be totally, uh, you should be driven by student needs. That'd be my response, Chris. I don't know if that answers it, but um, we definitely use that. Um, I remember a kid, uh, we had Springfield, Missouri uh, sitting there and I have this kid that I remembered his IEP at the end of his sophomore year. And I ran into opposition from the parent and I ran into opposition from our IEP case manager. And again, respectfully, I said, I don't see how this is going to help Ryan make it. And I, and I asked Ryan, I said, Ryan, what do you do on your free time? And he talked about electronics. Two years later, when Springfield, Missouri is walking through, I see Ryan. And I said, Ryan, tell me what it's like to be in Tiger Path. And he goes, his eyes light up. He's got a smile across his face. And he, 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 you know, he's a DCD autistic kid, but he, he had some uh, areas that he's really good at. And he started smiling. He goes, uh, Mr. Walsh, I'm down here like all day. And I just love it. And, you know, um, I think the opportunity to save that kid, he was despondent. Um, he didn't have mentorship. He was sitting in classes of 28, 30 people doing content all day long, by the way, not, not just a little, all day long. And I was just saying, can't we give them one period in the CT area? How about two? You get the rest. But we, with this kid, we have to heighten that exposure to CT opportunities. Any other questions? Do you ever take your show on the road to come and talk to our staff and our right. board? It's right here. <laughs> yeah. Hey, uh, some of you guys know me. I would, I would help anybody, you know, come to this conclusion. Um, it's, it's a must. It's one of the reasons why I wanted to share it here is that I feel that this is something that I'm, um, I've been part of, I would say, for the last 10 years of my life. This is my mission in education, is that we have got to change the content for kids. I consider myself a uh, curriculum uh, nut. Um, I think curriculum, uh, the exposure to curriculum is a real reason for a, a real linchpin of high school reform. If you don't have that, if you don't have uh, access to deep learning in the, in the CTE, you are not doing the best you can at the high school level, 100%. There are too many things that we do that don't have significant value for the kids and they spend way too much time there. Why? Because we've always done that. So yes, if you need, 
if you want me to, you know, talk to your staff, I, I'm open to it. But a lot of people will hate me. That's fine. I mean, I'm used to that. Okay, I'm going to go back and just finish, finish up. Um, so that's gone. Screen share again. Okay. Pat, I do have one quick question, if you don't mind. Yep. Are you, I'm in a building where our middle school and, and high school are under one roof. And so having that common bell schedule with shared staff is a really big deal. Is that the scenario you're in or no? Um, we do have it, as you can tell, every message goes to every person and we're, we're just, we're doing a new building. So we're going to, you know, stymie that hopefully. Um, but I'm going to, I'm going to go to the next slide. I just have to show you this because this is, this, this yeah. is some pretty important stuff. Okay. Key players, the key players, uh, the high school counselor is the most valuable player in your school. You really can't afford to have anything less than a great relationship with this person. They have to be on board. Word of mouth drives market share. And that is exactly what we do in high school with electives. It's about getting market share. Uh, if you're gonna get market share, you have to be interesting. It starts with your counselor. Uh, we have a very energetic middle school group of teachers, uh, leaders that are always looking to innovate. We've got a couple different Bush grants. Uh, we've got a Weedham grant. We've had over a million dollars donated to our school district in the last two years from various sources, including some local, because they believe in the Jagways plan that we have. Um, it starts with the middle school piloting uh, three years ago uh, when I got here, they had four hours and the kids were, were scheduling themselves on a daily basis. So that middle school science teacher has seventh and eighth graders in there at the same time depending on other things they need to do. Sometimes they need 90 minutes of science. You know, Some days they need to finish their math, um, but they're all basically on, on a standards-based uh, curriculum. And so sometimes they need more, sometimes they need less. This idea has survived. They are constantly pushing the status quo. And I would say, because some of them teach in the middle school and the high school, they're saying, when are we gonna do some of these things with high school? That spawned some of the changes that we're talking about in year two is when our social studies said we could do a alternating year curriculum. Our Spanish teacher saying that she could do Spanish one, two, and three together. You ask, how do you get that done? It would not have got done if our teachers did not uh, agree to this. And I, I'm gonna mention this there too. Uh, our administration, do, do, your, do your people who make the schedule, do they not want the frustration of building a student-driven schedule? I might have been Dave Ertle, you know, himself, who probably told me this way back when at a, at a principal's conference, but we have a student-driven schedule. What does that mean? Is that every year, everything's in play. Everything's in play. It's, it's driven by market share, not teacher market share, student market share. Your school board, as you propose changes and reductions, you have to convince your board that by reducing requirements in red tape, students are free to build meaningful and challenging curriculum. If you don't have space in your curriculum or your schedule, you need to create it. Do whatever you can. You have to have choice. One of the things that I will always encounter in high schools, as soon as you give students choice, Mr. Walsh, just tell me what to take. I don't know what I wanna take. Our students are basically lap dogs for our philosophy is that they never have to make choices. And then we ask them when they're seniors about what they're gonna do and they go, I don't know what I wanna do. Well, I don't have any experience. And I haven't had any mentoring around my choices. As soon as you create a void, now somebody has to make a decision. It might be the wrong decision, but it's a decision. I didn't like chemistry. I don't want to go to uh, school for, I don't want to do any more chemistry. I don't want to go healthcare. I really like hands-on things. I want to go to Wapton Science and be a diesel mechanic. That's a good choice to make before you go to college. Our core teachers' expectations were so high on personalized learning. Many key players played a role. Uh, social studies did, English did, uh, mathematics did, and pretty much if, if you're not part of the change in our school, including your superintendent or your principal, it's like you need to get the heck out of here. And we do talk about that. If you don't like this, there's other schools that do it traditionally. You know, that's an option for you. And teachers don't like hearing that but it is something that you need to be willing to say. 
So other potential scheduling ideas that fix problems, reduce barriers, modified block um, at the top of your list, you know, East Grand Forge, you mentioned that, uh, that's something that you definitely can do because now you're gonna be able to extend your time in lab classes. You could do digital uh, schedules. So you can do six or eight day digitals, uh, support hybrid courses anytime, anywhere. Um, we have our business teacher who teaches two classes in the same period. And so some of our kids, probably half of our kids take both of those classes, then the rest of the time is online. So um, our athletes tend to like our business classes because we put like accounting and entrepreneurship the same hour. It's two courses. He teaches both, but they don't have a first hour class because they're taking two during one period out there. So using your electives as a core group. Um, started doing this at Kenya Wanamingo. Um, instead of having uh, in that eight period day, instead of having, um, you know, just the four core, we actually increased FIAD and health as being a fifth core. And then we were able to put a teacher in there. I also made them a homeroom teacher. Um, up here, we can take, um, I have to actually get out of this for a second. Okay. Um, here, one of the ideas we've used is that we put our fax teacher first hour along with the middle school and she stays at first hour but because our kids can make that pick for five periods when they take fax their schedule changes the other four periods second hour i can have business and we rotate the kids through the business every six weeks of curriculum they have a different unit they can actually have different groups of kids. They don't have to be everybody all the time. So now kids are able to customize. Maybe they really like facts and they want to get facts two or three times and there's openings. I take, I take Mrs. Hagermeyer every time that there's a facts opening and I'm allowed in it. I get booted, but eventually I'm going to try to get her as much as possible. She's a great mentor to me and I love, I love learning in there. I'm interested in school because I get some choice. And then we work our core curriculum around that. What benefits the high school is that I don't have five elective periods all in one period and have all the seventh and eighth graders there because that, class, that hour looks crappy in the high school. No electives, no opportunities. That can't happen. So in a, in a middle school, high school, doing these things give you that flexibility. Um, share again. So key players back here. Um, uh, do you have to meet every day? You could have an eight period um, schedule, but meet three times every four days. You could have eight. We got a blank screen. Pat. Yeah, we got a blank screen there again. Yep. I'll get it here. Bring it pause. Resume share. All right, sorry about that. Stop share, resume share. Okay, so, okay, so, God darn it. So in that particular example, you have four days, six periods a day, you could have 24 periods every four days, but only have six of them meet each day. So they would have less transitions in a day. One of the impediments in Hutchinson to get out of the three by five schedules, I was shocked that the kids did not want out of the three by five. When I did my focus groups of students, I asked them why. And they said, the biggest reason we like the five period day is that we only have five classes at any one given time. I asked foreign exchange students the same questions. They said, tell me what's different about Hutchinson High School than Norway. Oh, I just love the five period day. Why is it? Because we can focus on four or five different subjects and I'm not doing eight or nine different things every night for homework. At Kenyon Wanamingo, our focus groups, the modified block, 96% of our students love the modified block. Why? Because Thursday and Friday, they had only four classes. We could do our advisories on Thursday and Friday um, we had advisories on those days only. Uh, they liked that. Um, it, was, it, it met their scheduling needs. And when they have games and activities and jobs on weekends and at the end of the week, they would only have four contents at most, maybe three, that they had to do their homework at the end of the week. 
it's a student driven idea. Uh, dynamic attendance, be present even when you're absence, uh, absent. Uh, we are installing ViewPath um, this spring so that all of our instruction will be videotaped and archived daily if you can't be viewing it live. So when our kids next year leave at 250 to go to Maple Lake, um, there's no reason they can't be tuning into the class while they're on the bus to Maple Lake. When our girls were in the volleyball tournament last year, um, they were doing their homework as they were getting ready for the, the semifinal game in the afternoon because our volleyball students are good students. And we said, even if you go to the game, you're still responsible for the content. So that was what I consider dynamic attendance. Even if you can't be um, present uh, with our new systems and our technology, um, this is something that is going to survive from the pandemic. Our conclusions, uh, and again, you can look at the Jagways video. Some of you have already seen it, but Christina will show in the video, she will talk about a lot of the things that I'm, I'm talking about here. Um, in the scheduling process, it can be painful. Um, any great idea that you have costs time. Um, one of the things that I'll say in the video is that if you think this is done without a lot of work and a lot of uh, you know, intuition, you're wrong. If you don't, if you don't put in the, the effort to do it with your schedule, you're gonna end up with the same schedule 20 years from now that you had there and your students are going to be disengaged. You gotta break free from some of the elephants in the room. Um, and another quote, um, a truly stable system expects the unexpected is prepared to be disrupted and awaits to be transformed. If you don't have a full desire, if you don't have a full desire to change, these things will never happen. Um, but you got to take, you got to tackle those headlong. And uh, I apologize where I didn't get as much into uh, some of the uh, uh, some of the academy things, but the academy ideas are implicit in, in these ideas as well. Um, there's just some of the structural things that I could maybe talk with you further. So if anybody does want to do that, I will schedule another. Uh, uh, academy only uh, period for like an hour or something uh, later. Uh, just email me that you are wanting that. And then lastly, I'm looking for feedback, you know, uh, too much of anything, too little of others. Um, you know, what was covered here that was good or bad or indifferent. So by all means, please let me know that because I'm, my objective is not to sit and talk to you about what I've done. Seriously, my objective would be that these are things that I think need to be part of every high school in America. And I do think that these things are replicable. As soon as you can start making one idea work, another idea will work. And if you can get two or three of these ideas, it's gonna be a lot better than doing one or two. If you can get four or five, you get the whole uh, Monty, the whole 22 teachers in the, in the high school, um, 22 here, 61 in Hutchinson. The more you get on the same page, the better, but don't stop because somebody doesn't wanna do it. Um, they do have options. There's, there's a teaching shortage. If you're a business teacher and you don't wanna do this, go to another school and get a business position. They're all over the place. Everybody wants a business teacher. And there's plenty of traditional schools out there. Um, you don't have to go very far to find somebody who, who doesn't wanna do all this stuff. Um, in my experience, this is a 10 or 20% type of district or high school that wants to tackle them and it has the means to do it. 